will also, I hope to repeat some of the recurring themes because we're covering a lot of information. Again, I'm trying to just give you ideas about when you go back to your own church and host these conversations, the kinds of things you and your people might be interested in pursuing further. Uh, but I do want to reiterate overarching themes. And so one of those, um, again, has to do with the cosmic level of this conversation, everything related to geography and theology, how it operates at the cosmic level uh, of history and space, uh, but also the very local level. Uh, we're doing that with Jesus. We'll also do that with Paul, with Acts and Revelation, a recurring theme. So what I want to do now, uh, talking about continue talking about uh, Jesus and geography is I want to move to point D on your outline under Jesus. And I want to take a dip into, if you will look at Matthew, turn with me to Matthew 15. Verses 21 to 28. We're just going to, I'm going to read through this if everybody's got that. It goes like this. The story goes like this. Uh, Jesus left that place and went away to the area of Tyre and Sidon. So there's Tyre and there's Sidon. Okay, it's in the area known as Phoenicia. Okay? So Jesus hangs out in Galilee, and you can see a border, right? Uh, so this is when he goes to Tyre and Sidon then, if he's from Galilee, he is in effect crossing a border of sorts, cultural, political, um, religious, because he is uh, uh, crossing into what we would call Gentile territory. There is some debate whether he crosses into it or whether it's a meeting on the border. We're not going to get into that technical debate. We're just going to say he crosses a border uh, when he does this. So Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he didn't answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. Okay, now I want you to hold your finger there, and I want you to flip over to Mark 7. So there's a tool that we use. In some, how many of y'all own a Gospel Parallels? Okay, yeah, you're the kind of people who would. All right, so in case you don't know what that is, um, that's not an insult, that's a great uh, but for the rest of us, so a gospel parallels is, uh, does anybody have one on them? So what it does, if you, uh, Bruce Thor Throckmorton is the one I use for my classes. Who, Ugo is asking what books we'll be using. Bruce Throckmorton's gospel parallels is one of them. And what it does is on the page, it lays out Matthew, Mark, and Luke next to one another. So you can compare how each gospel writer tells the story where the similarities are and where the differences are. The point of finding those similarities and differences is to try to understand what is distinctive about Mark, what is distinctive about Luke, what is distinctive about Matthew. It's not just to kind of play a fun word game, be like, oh, which one's real or all of that. The point is just to allow each author to really speak to you with their own voice. Because what happens is we tend to just read the lectionary or we read them all together and it all gets mixed up. When in real life, historically speaking, these are real authors, and they wrote real individual books, right? So when Matthew's writing Matthew, he doesn't have Luke, right? Their community, Matthew's community, only reads the Gospel of Matthew when it's first written. Mark's community is only reading the Gospel of Mark. They don't, they don't have our problem. <laughs> 
Like, look, it says this in Mark, Matthew's infancy narrative and this in Luke's. They only know their one text. It's only when we get the canon that you have the issue of having multiple Gospels. So a tool like the Gospel Parallels is an excellent, I would say crucial, resource for you to have for serious Bible study because it allows you to lay the text out and really understand how each Gospel is shaped. So if you had a Gospel Parallels and you opened to Matthew 15, right next to it you would see the story from Mark 7 or vice versa. If you opened to Mark 7 you would see Matthew 15. So in effect on the one hand you could argue they are the same story. Right? Having said that, when you look at Mark 7, let's look at how uh, this story goes um, in Mark 7, 24. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. So first of all, what do you notice? Doesn't mention Sidon. So that's the first thing. Okay. He entered a house and didn't want anybody to know he was there. Yet he couldn't escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was what? A Gentile. You see, Mark's making a point. Why do we care? Again, if you didn't grow up in church and you're reading this, you're like, what's a Gentile? I don't even know what that is, and who cares? But those of you in the know, what is a Gentile? It's us, yeah. It's anybody who's not Jewish, and Jesus is a Jew. I mean, if you get nothing out of this lecture... Uh, when you leave here today, I'm, I'm, I'm being funny and not funny because um, often a Christian interpretation divorces Jesus from his Jewish context. Jesus is a Jew um, from the day he's born until the day he dies. He's not a Christian, he's a Jew. Um, but we could talk about that more. Um, you don't have Christianity until you have a resurrection. It's a resurrection based tradition. So when he's walking around on earth, he's being a Jew. Um, now the woman was a Gentile, so that's a really big deal that the author's telling you that. Because Jesus, what? What? As a Jew, yeah, right? So um, it's a big deal. He's a Jew associating with a Gentile. Not only that, she's female, right? But this is interesting. A Gentile of Canaanite origin? What does Mark say? Syrophoenician. All right, and then the story basically goes on um, to be the same. We don't have time to go into the details of it. But what I want to point out, we, we see Phoenicia, right? And, you know, you're in the region of um, basically. So, so here's Phoenicia. There's Tyre and Sidon. They both mention Tyre. Ty they both mention Tyre. One mentions by both Tyre. But the point is he's operating in this region. Okay, so Matthew, that's just a political statement in Jesus' own time. Right, this is Palestine in the time of uh, Jesus. Um, this is Phoenicia. She started Phoenicia. So when you read in Matthew that a Canaanite woman comes out after everything we've done together this morning in all the Old Testament that we've read together, what's going on there? Okay. Are there any Canaanites in the first century? Okay. When you hear, when you're reading the Old Testament and Canaanites show up, are they thumbs up or thumbs down? We're saying with Babylon we decided thumbs down on Babylon, right? It's a devastator, it's a negative thing. When you come across Canaanites, when you're an Israelite coming across a Canaanite, thumbs down. So Canaanite, and a very important thing to know, know that most of us I think don't know, especially when we're new to reading scripture. So there aren't any Canaanites. Canaan isn't a thing in the first century, right? That's the story of the Old Testament. And so Matthew, who we already saw, loves the Old Testament and loves to use the typology of the Old Testament to take Old Testament categories, including geographical, and apply them to Jesus' own ministry. He, using Mark, so make, make one statement here. So when you're studying the Synoptic Gospels, Mark is written first. It's written around 66 to 70 CE. The Gospel of Mark is written. Matthew and Luke do not know each other's work, but both Matthew and Luke writing around 85 CE, both of them use the Gospel of Mark. 
in writing their narrative. Is that clear? So Matthew, when Matt, and, and both of them also use another source of sayings of Jesus. So you will find in Matthew and Luke, pertinent to our topic, in fact, you know, um, what the foxes have holes, the holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man, speaking of home, actually just came to me, speaking of home and land and all of that, he has no place to leave his head. Okay, that's, that's a, um, a saying of Jesus. And so you have a, a collection of sayings that appear in both Matthew and Luke that in fact do not appear in Mark. Okay, so Luke and Matthew share a lot, take Mark's material, copy, copy a lot of Mark stuff. Then each of them is using another sayings source of Jesus that we refer to as Q, which stands for the word Quella, Q-U-E-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which are you ready for this brilliant, creative, academic thing? Is the German word for source. So they're using Mark, then they're using a collection of sayings we refer to as Q. And then Luke is using some special Luke material, which we call special L. Um, and Matthew is using material only he has access to called special M, right? But my main point for this is it's not surprising that Luke and uh, Matthew, um, sorry, that, that Matthew has a, same, has a similar story to Mark because Matthew is using Mark. So what becomes important for putting these things and studying the Gospels next to each other that way is to say Mark told the story with the woman being Syrophoenician, which is accurate for Jesus' own time. Matthew takes her and makes her into a Canaanite. And he's doing that for symbolic reasons. Okay, So this is, and I don't want to dare... Um, well, I could do this. This would be like a Texas person. This is what I've come to learn in 16 years. Tell me if this is fair. This is like from a person from Texas talking about like a person from Oklahoma. Is that fair? I don't know. Help me with some analogies. Or Arkansas or whatever. I'm not from here. But like it's the person you're like, whoa, you're not helping them. I mean, I'm joking, right? But, but Canaanites, so joking aside, Canaanites are Israel's consummate enemy. They come in, they conquer Canaanites, they wipe out Canaanites. Canaanites and Israelites, no, they don't go together, right? So when Matthew chooses to tell the story and make her a Canaanite, what rhetorical effect does it have on you, the reader? Right? You're like, are you kidding me? So in terms of watching the scope of Jesus' ministry, and therefore, hopefully, our own. This hits us in a different way, in a different place, in terms of whom Jesus was called to serve. And he himself, even, in this narrative, has to grow in his understanding, even, of the scope of his own ministry. Right? It's why he says, he should come out, he's like, uh, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Like, this is confusing. Like, why are you here? What are you doing? What is this about? This is so wrong. You are so other, and you're other in the worst possible way. And yet, by the end of the story, he engages the other, the other whom he might have never imagined. And I don't know who that is for you personally, or for who, who that is for your own community, or we could ask who that is for our own nation, right? You can kind of get into these conversations. But the main point is, he is crossing a very serious border there. And this is a point where geography in the Bible, the conversation you've asked to have, this stuff is important because it matters theologically that she's Canaanite. And if you don't understand the Old Testament and geography, it doesn't make the same kind of impact on you. right? Because it's also this business about, I came to the, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you compare Matthew's story to Mark's, he doesn't, well, let's just do it. Look at, look at Mark. Seven, and I'm going to move us on. It's hard to leave biblical texts, though. They're all it's good stuff. Um, so, a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. She came out, bowed down, 
The woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of his daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, sir, even the dogs on the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, for saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. So you'll notice in Matthew's story, and you remember Matthew started the story with Abraham and the genealogy and the exile. It is a story of Jewish history. And if you're doing Jewish history, you need to know what Canaanites are. Mark doesn't have a genealogy at all. Mark does his gospel in a really different way. Matthew has Jesus say, I came only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we watched the development of the house of Israel all morning together, right? And so Jesus is a Jew ministering in a Jewish context. That's his context. And then it gets exploded open and expanded in this story, right? He says it twice. This is also a phrase, this phrase only occurs in Matthew, where it has Jesus saying, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He also tells his own disciples in chapter 10, go nowhere among the Gentiles, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In chapter 10, so five chapters earlier. So Matthew has Jesus kind of expanding the notion of, um, of his ministry. So I don't want to say more about that because I want to leave it at that because what I want you to get from it is the notion of border crossing. Um, and to understand border crossing, you have to understand where the borders are in the first place, then and now, uh, I would argue. So that's one example is in Matthew. Another example that I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I invite you to go back home and study is one I referred to earlier, which is uh, the story in Mark uh, 5 of the Gerasen demoniac. And uh, this, so if you look in Mark 5, the beginning, you have this long story. I wish we had time to read, but 5, 1 through 20, the healing of the Gerasene demoniac. Sometimes he's called the Gadarene demoniac. We're not really sure. Uh, for a lot of these things, it ends up, you're not really sure where these things are. It's uh, east of the Jordan River. So it's in the area of the Decapolis that I talked about earlier. So we, we talked about this um, uh, earlier, and you all, what I said, what, what did he say the name is? The name is Legion. And so this is, again, a very serious border crossing. Jesus has crossed over from his regular homeland, etc., gone over into the Decapolis, which is the heart of, um, of yeah, Roman culture. Uh, a lot of us play with Mark 5. So, so one of the things we also didn't talk about, and if I were going to give you a bibliography that was, at, at, that was respectable in terms of uh, sources on it, diversity, being up to date, et cetera, instead of just giving you a little something to start with, there would be a section in there on what's called post-colonialism. Because post-colonialism is... Um, uh, a crucial kind of theology that deals with land and borders and politics and peoples and people who are in power and the people who are subjugated, um, et cetera. And so I write on disability theory a lot, and I've written on Mark 5. Um, it's out there somewhere in an essay, I think probably accessible on the web, um, on disability. And I use Mark 5 because it's very interesting. This man, what is this man suffering from? And how much of what he's suffering from comes from uh, the system he's living over, under, the imperial system. I mean, the fact that the demons are called legion, which is a Roman military uh, name, uh, gets us into all of these questions about um, governments and power and land. So a whole area that really attends to this brilliantly is the area of post-colonial interpretation of the New Testament or of the Bible. Um, but what I want you to see here at the very bare bones minimum is this is another example under this section on the outline of Jesus doing serious border crossing into places and dealing with the other. Um, and in case, and then we saw in, in John 4, if we go there, we'll never come out again because that's probably my favorite story. No, I don't, what does it even mean anymore for me to say I have a favorite story? And the students are always like, I don't think you know what the word favorite means. You've ruined the word. Um, so yeah, so this is my, you can come and touch if you want before you leave. This is my oil lamp that I bought 
from Samaria, where the uh, woman of Samaria is from. I'm not going to tell you how much money uh, I paid for this one, but I have a certificate that says it's authentic. <laughs> and, um, you what? Handle with care. Handle with care, yeah. This one costs $5 at a souvenir shop, and it looks a lot like the one that I have the certificate for. But you know what? Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. That's one of the few long distance phone calls I made to my husband the first time I was back in Israel to kind of explain the credit card charge that was going to hit. Because <laughs> the way you ring up an ancient oil lamp in, uh, in Shechem, modern novelist, because also you're, you're in an area where your credit card company doesn't allow you to Anything that's West Bank or Palestinian, your credit card has issues with. So let me just put it this way. I went through a lot of trouble with my credit card company to get this. So do handle with care. Um, anyway, um, I, I really love her. I have pictures I could show you of, you know, so Jacob's Well is actually there. Nablus, you can go there. How many of you have drunk from Jacob's Well? Mireya, yeah. I, have, I have a picture. I could show a PowerPoint slide of Mireya drinking from the... So you can actually go there, and the well is indeed deep. So the, the priest who uh, runs the church there, he'll pour a cup of water there, and you hear how long it actually takes to hit. Uh, so it is very deep, and you can, um, you can drink from it. Um, so it's an amazing story. But a couple of um, the real reason I just want to bring it up here is it's another example of border crossing. It's a different kind of border crossing, because you will say to me, if my pointer would work, it would be pointing, you see Judea. Down in the south, you see Samaria kind of in the middle, and then Galilee up there. So the text in John 4, if you flip over to John 4, says this. In John 4, verse 3, Jesus left Judea. Right? Everybody see where Judea is? And uh, started back to Galilee. But he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Suhar. So you're in this area here. All right, everybody with me? All right, here's Suhar. All right, so but here's the thing. Um, it's the text says uh, Jesus had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samaritan city called Suhar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. So again, you're picking this up in your hotel. You've never read the Bible. Again, you're thanking the Gideons um, for, for the Bible. I love that they do that. I, I think it's a great ministry to put a Bible in every hotel room. I wish they would put a translation. I could actually understand a little better. Because even I'm like, I'm like, I'm an actual biblical scholar, and I can't figure this out. But having read the Old Testament, you understand a deeper layer. When you see anything geographical, after today, if you see anything in your Bible ever, it has something geographical about it. I hope you understand it's going to deserve more attention. Because when the authors choose to tell you about some places, not other places, and at certain times, they're doing it because there's meaning they're trying to convey by it. So same here. We spent some time with Jacob, Jacob's well. So we also know wells are the place that betrothals happen, marriage, right? Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. And it was about noon. Okay, so the text says you ha he had to go through Samaria. On the one hand, yeah, Samaria is between Judea and Galilee. On the other hand, no. And here I'm just going to read straight out of a footnote out of my John book uh, that I, where I talk about this. And I say, because it's faster to do this, in going from Judea to Galilee, normally one would have proceeded down the Jordan Rift Valley, thus skirting Samaria on the eastern side. Okay. Or you would go on the coastal highway, uh, thus skirting it on the western side. Both would be faster than the hilly and mountainous route through the interior of Samaria, where Suhar, or modern-day Shechem, is. Okay, So when it says he had to go through Samaria, it's actually unusual that he went the way he went. Knowing that, what does that mean to you? In what way did he have to go to Samaria then? Right. It's, a, it's for a theological reason. 
right? And, and it's a giveaway by the end of the story because Samaritans, um, Samaritans aren't as bad as Gentiles. Let's put it that way. So Samaritans are, they're somewhere in between Jew and Gentile from an Israelite perspective. And we don't have time to go through all of that. Again, I wrote all about that. If you want to read in detail, you can read all about that, and it ties to the Old Testament. But the point is, Samaritans and Jews don't get along on certain things. One worships on Mount Gerizim, one worships on Mount Zion. So again, these geographical fights are always theological fights as well. So um, from a Jewish perspective, Samaritans are not quite faithful because they worship, after, after they're conquered by Assyria, they worship, and other people, they worship those foreign gods. They worship God, our God, but they also worship some other ones. And so, you know, Israel's not, it's considered idolatrous. And idolatry, in Old Testament terms, is always pick, pitched in what kind of metaphor? What metaphor is used when Israel is idolatrous? How do the prophets talk about that? Adultery. They sexualize it. Right? And remember, wells are places of betrothal. They're kind of sexy places um, in their own way. I've literally never said that statement before. So uh, <laughs> that was the world premiere of that statement. Um, uh, and so what you have going on here is a whole theology around um, proper places of worship. Who's got it? Who doesn't? Um, and this, this accusation of idolatry, you've had five husbands, the one you're living with now isn't your husband. Jesus comes along and makes number seven, which is a perfect number um, in terms of meaning and symbol. So Jesus, the bridegroom, is now bring, wooing Samaria into covenantal faith. That's a lot of stuff I realize I just said. Um, so you can read about it in here. So the point I want to make is this is not accidental. There's wells, it's Jacob, it's all piling up to convey meaning. So, okay, fine. His mission is to Israelites, for sure. Well, now we see this boundary crossing. He's intentionally going and reconciling and bringing together, right, Samaria as part of his scope. Then she runs, as we said earlier, she runs, tells all the people. They encounter Jesus themselves, and then they declare Jesus to be the savior of the cosmos, the world, right? And so again, I'm trying to get at the global and the local, right? In case all of that is not enough, um, then you can look at Matthew 4.25, where Matthew makes this point. I mean, we could just sit here all day long, and maybe I'll ask your opinion, of ways Jesus crosses borders, honestly. And I'd like to hear you say which ones I'm missing, but... In a summary statement, Matthew says this, And great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, right there, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan, Transjordan. That pretty much covers everything in the area, right? Okay, what places of um, what places of Jesus boundary crossing or going outside the norms of what the disciples expect anyway, and even sometimes what he expects, but at least what the disciples uh, or other folks take him to task for. What am I missing that you're thinking of? Okay, such as social. He said there are social borders. What's that? He eats with sinners. Yep. Okay. So social borders, okay? Yeah. So we could we could multiply some of these, I assure you, um, even geographically. But you get the idea, okay? Of Jesus border crossing. All right. So we've got the cosmic global level and the very local level, and it always involves hospitality and interaction and engagement with across borders. Let me put it, leave it there. Um, okay. So the last piece of Jesus here. Um, uh, I want to touch base on. When you're talking about geography and Jesus, I want to bring it into the current uh, just a little bit. And that is a lot of you have gone to the Holy Land. Uh, so I have an image of, you know, even Golgotha is named, um, oops. 
Here's Golgotha. You can't see it anymore, the place of the skull. You can kind of see how it looks like a skull. Right? So this is traditionally where Jesus is. There's a lot of, so there's a lot of debates. This kind of gets into it. When you go to the Holy Land, it's a kind of an interesting experience, and we could take a long time to talk about that from the people who have been there. Um, because you go to sites, it's like, oh, this happened here. And then it's like, well, maybe it did, maybe it didn't. We don't know. Now there's two tombs, like there's two garden tombs of, of I mean, there's two tombs of Jesus. You know, you go to just two baptism sites. Um, so there's always this kind of debate about where things happen. It gets really interesting for our subject because why do we care and why? Does it matter to you if this is the very place that Jesus did this? or not. I find some people get just very elated and excited and deeply moved. I mean, almost everybody at some point gets very moved, I think, by being in the Holy Land, the geography of it, by being in the desert, by being in the lush green things. Some other people find themselves sometimes disappointed because they go and they find out, well, maybe he was baptized here, maybe he was baptized there. And it gets you to start thinking about what does it mean to you as a Christian for these places to be pilgrimage site, pilgrimage sites to you, how does land work in your own uh, theology? Um, so we have a conversation about that, and I have people even do some reading about it. Because is the place holy? When you call out the Holy Land, is it holy because um, Jesus did this, that, and the other at place X, Y, and Z? Or is it made holy by the fact that thousands of years worth of pilgrims? Christian pilgrims have gone to these places, right, to worship and pay homage um, and have a certain kind of encounter, right? And if that's the case, in a way, it doesn't really matter if the tomb is here or there. I mean, it was somewhere pretty close by, I can assure you. And the whole thing kind of reminds me, do you all know that quote um, by Mark Twain? Help me with it. Where, he, where a friend tells him that he's going to go to Mount Sinai. It's like, I aim to go to Mount Sinai before I die. So I can see where God gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And reportedly, Mark Twain said, well, why don't you just stay home and keep them? <laughs> so, you know, there's also that when it comes to Christian, uh, Christian pilgrimage. Um, so I would say there is an intellectual side, you know, because I, I made the statement at the beginning, I don't know if I'm going to believe this statement by the end of the day or the end of the week, you'll help me think about it. When I said, I don't, I don't really think Christians have a special place. Um, the closest we get in a way, I think, is the Holy Land. If you're Catholic, it may be the Vatican. A trip to the Vatican may, I don't know, I'm not Catholic, may be more meaningful to you than a trip to the Holy Land. Um, but I will say that there is some kind of emotional, if it's not intellectual, there is definitely some kind of emotional connection, even for Christians going to the Holy Land. So the hence my show and tell. Again, I've got my dirt from the pool of Siloam that you are very free to, here, I'm just going to take it out and pass it around. I'm going to take out, this is dirt from the pool of Siloam. This is the actual pool of Siloam where Jesus, so just, just, you can even open it and touch it if you're one of those. So I'm the hokey person on the trip. Robert Hunt, whenever he goes, he's the cynic. If you know Robert, He's like, well, we don't know. Was this really here? So his job was to be the cynic and the realist or whatever. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, Jesus was totally baptized here. Y'all, seriously, come down in here. And we baptize everybody, and we do it all. We scoop up, and we sing. How many? And how many? Oh, eight. What? Hymns? Eight. Oh, and we sing. We go to every place, and we open our Bibles, and we, like, get in the zone. And we're, like, reading it. And we're like, can you picture this? And then we sing in hymns, and we're dunking under the water. And we're, we're doing it all. You know, I love the hokey, cheesy um, side of it. Like, it's meaningful to me. Um, it's definitely not meaningful to everybody. And then you can stay on the bus, and that's fine. And text people at home, and, you know, it's fine. Everybody does what everybody needs to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, in here, okay, then I'll stop for real. But if y'all want to see and touch these, I mean, there's like a rock in here from the primacy of Peter Church. So, you know, when, when Jesus is on the beach with Peter, you know, and says, feed my sheep, and, and all of that. Well, this rock is from the place that happened, people. So if you feel the need to pull it out and touch it, these are like things that came from the shores of the Galilee. So I got a little bit of everything up here for the hokey cheesy people like me. Um, okay, last one, last two. So this is a Jerusalem cross. Jerusalem has a special cross 
right? And this is really nice. You should bring all these back for your friends because they're prayer crosses. They can hold them in their hand. Um, this is a fish, as you can see, because it came from the town of Magdala. If we had time, I'd show you lots of slides from Magdala because when I go to Magdala on these trips with my students, I actually forget I'm the leader of the group. I just do. I just desert everybody. And I run, literally run, because there's never enough time, with my little backpack, bouncing around. I run over, and I'm touching things, and you know, very quickly, deeply meditating, um, as fast as I can. Um, what is that new country song that's out? I'm going to love you. I'm going to love you really slowly, just as fast as I can. I don't know. I'm getting off topic. Um, anyway. <laughs> If you go with me to Palestine and Israel, please forgive me when I ditch you at Magdala because it is the place Mary Magdalene is from and it's a, the industry there is fishing, hence the, the fish. So all of that is to say, I love to do the in the footsteps of Jesus thing, right? Be there, Jesus was there, um, etc. Fine, and we do that with our students. And we call that, I call that the dead stones part of the trip. Okay. Jesus did this. He was there. However, this is a country with real living people in it now. Um, we do a whole thing on the living stones, and especially the Perkins students, because if you're an MDiv student at Perkins, uh, it's not technically required, I think, yet um, to do an immersion, a cultural immersion, by the time you graduate, because we have a strong conviction that those of us uh, who are leaving Perkins to minister Minister in a global context. The days are gone. If you think you're just over in your little village thing, or if you are, fine, go do it. But we want people to actually be a force in the world um, and a public theologian and know, again, understand that the Christ Christianity has global concerns, uh, cosmic uh, concerns. So we do the immersion part. So uh, we go there and we do all of that, but we pay attention to what's happening on the ground now in this real land that is deeply conflicted over land and history and theology. So, you know, I joke around because I'm Baptist, so I have a number of little bracelets with WWJD on them, you know, which if you're not in the know, that stands for what would Jesus do? It's supposed to remind you at any moment, you know, look down and be like, oh, what would Jesus do in this moment? Um, I stopped wearing it because I just thought eventually I'm offending Jesus because I rarely choose to do. Um, <laughs> I mean, I know, I hate it because you like, you know what you're supposed to do and then you're like, oh, forget that. I'm too angry. Um, so uh, I, I say, okay, well, what if we all ran around the whole time we're in the Holy Land and instead have bracelets that say WWJB? Where would Jesus be if he took a trip here today? How would he arrange his itinerary? Who would he be with? How would be he using? He would be. How would he be using his time? Right. Thus, we spend, and they can all testify. Um, you know, time going to Palestinian refugee camps. Um, yeah, the trip I was just on, we went to refu Palestinian refugee camps and also Jewish settlements. Um, again, we met with Israeli officials. We met with Palestinian officials. Um, so. In, uh, in that vein, I want to just remind us, again, when we talk about geography and Jesus and going to Samaria and doing all of this stuff, it's fantastic and wonderful. But that is kind of a conversation about what the text meant back then. And as Christians, it's incumbent upon us to talk about what the text means now. So when we were there, I don't know if you all remember reading this poem. We study at the Shalom Hartman Institute, our students do too, and I was introduced to this poem from a Jewish uh, perspective of tourists coming to do Christian Disneyland. Um, I mean, they don't call it Christian Disneyland, that's what I call it. Uh, so the poem is called Tourists, and I think it serves as a warning. Visits of condolence is all we get from them. They squat at the Holocaust Memorial, they put on grave faces at the Wailing Wall, and they laugh behind heavy curtains in their hotels. They have their pictures taken together with our famous dead at Rachel's tomb and Herzl's tomb and on Ammunition Hill. They weep over our sweet boys and lust after our tough girls and hang up their underwear to dry quickly in cool blue bathrooms. 
Once I sat on the steps by a gate at David's tower. I placed my two heavy baskets at my side. A group of tourists was standing around their guide and I became their target marker. You see that man with the baskets? Just right of his head, there's an arch from the Roman period. Just right of his head. But he's moving, he's moving. I said to myself, redemption will come only if their guide tells them. You see that arch from the Roman period? It's not important. But next to it, left and down a bit, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetables for his family. Thoughts, reflections, I hesitate to say we're done with Jesus. <laughs> I prefer to say we're moving on to Paul. Um, but before we, right, they don't sound exactly the same, yeah. Same, same content, different idea. Okay, so there are uh, hardly any Christians left in the Holy Land. I'll put it simply out. There are 1,100, as of 2016, there are 1,100 uh, Christians in the Gaza Strip. And the West Bank holds a lot of traditional Christian sites. There are, I'm going to perhaps get this wrong, but I think 11,000 uh, Christians left in Bethlehem. Um, it's, they're just basically are, Christians make up 2% of the population of Israel. Let me find my modern Israel map. Okay, so here's the West Bank. Here's Gaza Strip. So you have about 1,000 Christians left there. And um, Bethlehem itself, like I said, Christians make up a little less than 2% of the population in Bethlehem, uh, the birthplace of Jesus. Um, and uh, I think there's like 165,000 Christians in Israel, something like that. But especially if you're, so if you're a Christian in the West Bank or in Gaza, if you're a Palestinian Christian, you're having a tough time in life. Economically, you're, if you're a Christian versus a non-Christian Palestinian, you're ahead of a lot of other people. And so for the long and short of it, if you're a Christian Palestinian, you have opportunities to get out. <laughs> That's one way to put it. To send your children to a place where there's a future for them as Palestinian people, which is a little harder to do. It's a pretty serious commitment. Um, Mitri Raheb of the Christmas Church in Bethlehem, uh, his, one of his most recent book, written with my friend Suzanne Watts Henderson, who's a New Testament scholar, Mitri and Suzanne, if you look on your bibliography, have written a wonderful book. You'll see, if you buy it, you'll see I blurbed the back of it. Um, I love it. It's a great book. It's called The Cross in Contexts. Um, something like reading the cross through the eyes of suffering in Palestine. Um, and Mitri is very interesting because he's a Lutheran pastor of the Christmas church. Um, he's a Palestinian Christian. And the thing is, in a way, y'all can jump in, those who've been with me. You know, in a way, in Bethlehem, it's not Christians and Muslims. It's they're all Palestinians. Their bigger identity, what holds, they have stuff in common because they're all kind of economically depressed and are, there's a separation wall. It's very stark. So the new separation wall that has gone up is in Bethlehem, like getting in and out of Bethlehem. And there's a separation wall, and there's, it's, it's a bad scene. It's a bad situation. Um, so it's interesting. The West, we think of, oh, the Muslims are against the Christians. The reason there's so few Christians in the West Bank is because the Muslims. And if you think that, it's a much more complicated situation than that. It's that a lot of Palestinian Christians, people are emigrating if they can. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, except it's kind of not, because we're going to get back into this a little bit later. And I do want you to have a taste of how important it is, I think, when you go to the Holy Land, absolutely be as cheesy as I am, um, but also understand what is Christ calling us to in this day and age with respect to um, being agents of peace as much as we can in the, whole, in the Middle East. Yeah. And we're doing our theme of geography and the Bible, and we're paying attention 
to the global, the cosmic, the local, right? You get into the Apostle Paul, who makes the statement that uh, our citizenship is not in this world. It's kind of interesting because Paul himself was a Roman citizen. Um, it's kind of easy to say probably for someone, it's easy to say our citizenship is not in this world when you actually have the benefits of citizenship, uh, I think. But in the end, anyway, his citizenship did not save his life. All right, so Paul, let's talk briefly about Paul. Paul the Roman citizen, Paul the Jew, listen to all the things he is. He's a Roman citizen, he's a Jew, he's a Christian, He's an apostle to the Gentiles. That's what he calls himself, apostle to the Gentiles. And he is a martyr of Rome. And he is all of these things at the same time. So he was also multilingual, right? So again, crossed all kinds of boundaries um, and was really a citizen of the world. So the world, you could say the world was his home, and you could say the world was not his home. Because also everywhere he went, he got beaten up and thrown in prison. <laughs> so it depends on how you decide uh, or not. So I want to take a look and spend a little bit of time in Acts 21 and 22. So this is when Paul's under trial. Again. So, he says in, um, yeah, if you turn to Acts 21, and Acts, by the way, in case you don't know, Acts is written by the same author who wrote the Gospel of Luke. So we often refer to this as Luke-Acts, Luke-Acts, because the same author wrote it. It just gets interrupted by John when uh, the canon is formed because the people who made the canon formed it according to genre of literature. So they put the Gospels together. And Acts is a historical book before you move into the epistles. Um, so Paul tells us that he was born um, a citizen. Okay. So he, uh, you'll notice, I mean, why does he tell the, um, well, let's read, let's read this in Acts 21, 37. Just as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, may I say something to you? And the tribune replied, and this is interesting for our subject, do you know Greek? Okay, so Paul's a Jew in the first century, right? So do you know Greek? then you are not the Egyptian who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew. So Paul is a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia. Okay, so this is the region he's from, Cilicia a citizen of an important city. I beg you, let me speak to the people. When he had given him permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned to the people for silence. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, I'm now in Acts 22.1, listen to the defense that I now make before you. When they heard him addressing them in Hebrew, or, yeah, okay. Your new RSV says Hebrew. So do you speak Greek? You have Hebrew? They became even more quiet. Then he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city. He's in Jerusalem when he's saying this. But brought up in this city, Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, a rabbi. So, what do you think? Paul's multicultural, <coughs> multilingual, right? Um, 
I can't get into this subject too much, but we're reading right now the book of Acts talking about Paul. So this is, this is a vision of Paul written by the author of Luke. So when you dig in, as you know, those of you who have done serious Bible study, when we're reconstructing the life of Paul, we have multiple sources. First we have, we have his own letters, right? And so Paul's letters are basically all written in the 50s, let's say, okay? Because he's dead by 64. He's uh, martyred. Uh, by 64. Okay, so we have Paul's own letters in the 50s. We have the book of Acts, so written somewhere near the end of the first century. And then we have the third set of stuff we use to some degree. So there's the letters, when you say the letters of Paul, list the letters of Paul for me that you have in mind. So we have seven letters that we call undisputed letters of Paul, right, that no scholar anywhere would disagree that Paul wrote these seven letters. They are? Romans, yeah, his magisterial last final letter, yep. First Corinthians, second Corinthians. Galatians. Nope, Ephesians we're putting over here. Philippians. Philemon, or Philemon, there's different ways of pronouncing it. And first Thessalonians. Okay, so those, nobody would say Paul didn't write those. Then we have letters that uh, would be considered Deuteropauline, or in the legacy of Paul. Right, that are written in the name of Paul but may not have been written by Paul himself. And there you have Ephesians and Colossians. Those go together and they are literarily dependent on one another. So the person writing Ephesians knew Colossians or vice versa. They're very similar. Um, you have the pastoral epistles, which are 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, right? And they go together. Uh, they're teaching, they're not particularly pastoral at every moment. Uh, they're teaching Timothy, for instance, and how to be pastoral. Um, so the pastoral epistles, and then Second Thessalonians is truly disputed. You get people kind of wondering one way or the other. So understand, we're getting Acts version of this. So when you reconstruct Paul's life, we're not going to get into whether he really did grow up in Tarsus or Jerusalem. You see the biblical witness of who Paul is, and for our purposes, he's somebody with a global scope um, who who traverses all kinds of. Uh, of boundaries uh, and is also very concerned about the local level. So that's Paul. Um, in the end, of course, Paul's a Roman citizen, but in the end, he did choose God over country like the apostles before him. Again, this language in Acts where we find all of this, from the very beginning there's this pressing issue. Whom shall we obey, God or human beings? And like I said, then Paul ends up in trouble all the time, in prison all the time, shipwrecked, and then finally uh, martyred. All right, so that's Paul the citizen. Then if you look at Paul the not citizen, I call it, uh, next. So what's funny is that when we read Paul's own words in Philippians, he says this to some Christians in Philippi while he was in prison. So Philippi is considered one of the prison epistles because he's writing it uh, from prison. He says, but our citizenship, this is Philippians 3, 20 to 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of His glory, by the power that also enables Him to make all things subject to Himself. So, Paul, uh, in the end, kind of just considers himself what? His true citizenship uh, comes from God and God's perspective. Okay, so he thinks of every place in a way, he's like a military brat, in that he thinks of every place as a host nation. Um, how did he get in prison? By preaching to the Gentiles, right? So um, Paul, I would say, is taken with both heaven and earth. He doesn't choose one over the other, right? Some of us make the mistake of being all about heaven and we kind of don't always get as engaged with earth. Uh, as we should be. Some of us are so wrapped up in earth and, right, that we kind of forget, yes, but the way we approach earth and everything we do, um, society, communities, families, justice, right, must always be directed by the view of heaven, God's own perspective. And Paul manages uh, to handle both at the same time. So he's very taken with the notion of it being on earth as it is in heaven. He's not the first one to say that. Who else do you know? Uh, right? 
you might say that yourself uh, here and there, recite that prayer. And, for, and Paul doesn't really mean someday. Paul means now. He's an incredibly urgent kind of guy. He had a strong sense of living in an urgent time when the world was sorely in need of the good news of Jesus Christ, right? Not the pseudo good news of the emperor. A world in need of the peace of Jesus Christ, which he says surpasses all understanding, not the Pax Romana that we all understand perfectly well and some days even buy into. Note, though, that Paul's heaven talk never removes him from the concerns of living in this real world. Quite the opposite. The heaven perspective shapes his concerns. So we said earlier, right after the thing he says in Philippians that I just told you about, Philippians 3, our citizenship is in heaven, it's right after that that he shows this concern for Euodia and Suntyche, right, and shows the connection between the two. And you can see the connection because he starts verse 4, 1 with, therefore, tell them to get along. So they're, uh, they're connected. Then he says this in Philippians 1. He says, I want you to know, beloved, what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. He's in prison. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. The most of the, uh, and most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering in my imprisonment. And then he goes on, uh, and he says, um, so, so they're praying um, to kind of get him out of prison. He says, it's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by my speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted now, as always in my body, whether by life or by death. Okay, so this is a guy who, we don't have time to look at all these things, missionary journeys, but he was constantly on a missionary journey. Right? He was so bowled over by, um, by his encounter with Jesus Christ and his vision for how God wanted the world to be that he was just constantly, uh, just constantly on mission, like I said, and constantly in prison. And so he cared about the world, but he also, he also held on loosely to the extent that he could say, it doesn't even, really even matter whether I live or die. Like, I'm all in. And I will obey God. And I don't care if I end up in prison or what I do. I'm all in, even if I die. And then he famously says in 121, For to me, living is Christ, and dying, what? Is gain. He says, if I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, and I don't know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed, actually. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that's far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I'm convinced of this, I know I'll remain and continue with all you for your progress and joy in the faith. Right? He holds on loosely, um, and he has a strong sense of vocation. Um, so he then calls, uh, says, Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or an absent hear about you, I'll know you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. So I would say that Paul manages to be deeply engaged in it at an extremely local, geographically specific level. So where are his letters to? The Romans in Rome. Corinth, Corinthians. Thessaloniki for Thessalonians. Philippi, this is a place. Right? Philemon's the only kind of personal letter. So it just goes to show, and does he write one letter and then says, hey, all the churches, I got one statement for everybody. Right? He, he gets so involved. What was the thing? Where's Bob? Where's Bob? There's probably, like, you're like 20 of us are named Bob. Um, Bob, my Bob, my driver. Bob, where are you in the room? Oh, you. You're right here in front of me. So... So you remember uh, yesterday, you're like, whoa, what's she going to say? 
This is being taped. Yeah. Um, so you made a really uh, important comment last night. You said someone came to your church and was you were doing some kind of seminar, and they talked about seeing people. Like, do you see people? When people come to your church, do you see them? So there's a certain kind of, Bob's talking about, so the, the statement was made, do you actually see people? You know, not in a generic kind of way, but in a really drill down, be there. And Paul exhibits that, uh, I think, beautifully. Right? He is able to be local and geographically specific, but to simultaneously hold on to the world, as I said, rather loosely, able to see God at work in the mess of human history and politics. He doesn't quit a church because there's problems there. Like, no kidding, there's problems there. It has human beings in it. Um, so he's never naive, but he's always hope-filled. He's always gospel-filled, so that no circumstance derails his faithfulness to God's vision of a world where there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male and female, as he says in Galatians 3.28. All of the binaries and hierarchies that we create, they're not on earth as in heaven when we do that. He writes very specific letters to specific churches in specific places with specific problems but he always has a global perspective and design. He has a conflicted relationship with governing authorities. He can write Romans 13, go back and read that, about obeying the government, but if that government gets in the way of the gospel, he always chooses to serve the gospel. In the end, that government itself executes him, even though he is a citizen. This asks us, I think makes us ask, what are the implications of this for Christians today as we navigate our relationship to the government in whatever host nation we find ourselves in? Uh, Christianity, also, we see from Paul, is a proselytizing religion that is not bound at all by a particular land that this map should show you. Right? He is responsible for expanding Christianity in an explosive uh, fashion. Uh, then you all, oh, here's my data. Uh, I say, ironically, there are hardly any Christians at all in Palestine, who's very effective uh, with the Gentile mission. Um, so yeah, there's the numbers, 1,100 in Gaza, 11,000 in Bethlehem. Um, in 1950, Christians made up 86% of Bethlehem and the surrounding villages. Um, so, and we talk about that with the students, and the students go back and forth, but whether that's a sad, sorrowful thing, or whether, you know, as a Christian, does that matter? Um, so let us close this section. I'm going to give you all a break, uh, but I'd like you to, to you know, leave this section thinking about how your own identity or your community's identity, um, how is your identity and your community's identity like Paul's? Are you multicultural at home anywhere in the world with anybody? Uh, most folks he worked with, in fact, stayed put. It wasn't everybody's call. Uh, to go out and about like him. Uh, some traveled about like Prisca, Priscilla, also known as Prisca, and Aquila. So I would say not all call pe people are called to be on the road uh, the same way, but I do think Paul thinks all people are called to cross borders and engage um, in uh, ways that grow the gospel. He puts it this way. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel so that I may share in its blessings. This is the word of the Lord.